Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this lecture. We're going to be deriving today the capacity of a pinned base plate, and this is part of the Stellenbosch University Structural Design 424, the Steel Design Module. What we're looking here now is how to analyze a base plate where there's only a axial load. So there's only a compressive load coming down the column. So in our layout here, we've got our column, which I'm highlighting now. And this column is experiencing now some axial load coming down it. And we need to now find out how do we design the base plate, which is what connects it to the concrete. Uh, how do we design that? So we've got some force CU that's being placed onto it. And we also have a section through, which we'll be using soon. So I'm showing that on the side, section AA. In terms of our design, when the load comes down the column in yellow, it will reach the base plate and then spread out into the concrete. Now, over the years with testing and research and such, a simplified method has been developed for calculating capacity. Basically, what we do is we assume the load spreads out a uniform distance from the column on all sides. So what I'm drawing now is a frame all the way around the column, which spreads out what we call a distance C away from the column. And so this hatched area is a distance C. So we are going to use that for our calculations. And this hatched area here must be sufficiently large enough to carry the applied force CU, the axial compressive load coming down the column. And what we're going to do now is start going through and deriving how do we find uh, the value C, because from C then we can determine our base plate thickness. So looking at it, I'm going to start now uh, with the calculations. And firstly, there's a couple of assumptions we're making in this calculation. So my assumptions are the stress under the base plate is 0.6 FCU. Stress under base plate is 0.6 FCU. And it's either that or nothing. So what that'll look like in a diagram is, for instance, this is my section I would have a rectangular stress block under the column, like that. And then this is 0.6 FCU under the base plate. And then it suddenly goes to zero outside of that. So to be zero outside of the hatched area, the red hatched area, it is zero in those zones. In real life, it wouldn't be like that. It wouldn't suddenly and magically go from 60% of the concrete strength to zero stress. But it's a useful assumption which simplifies our um, design quite significantly and it's safe. So that's our first assumption. The stress under the base plate is 60% of the concrete compressive strength. And then load evenly distributed evenly distributed a distance C from the column C from the column edge from the column edge and it the way we're deriving it now it doesn't actually matter what base plate well what column size and shape you use the methodology will apply to anything if you're using resources such as the south african institute of steel construction green book they are pre-done equations which make it quicker to get to the final capacity but they only apply to specific shapes we're just doing a generic calculation method for any shape any size doesn't matter what so as i was saying load evenly distributed the distance c from the edge of column and then C is um, C uh, determines the base plate thickness. Determines the required base plate thickness, which we will call T B. T subscript B. And that will be this thickness here. T 
be thickness of base plate because in a normal design once you have the loads from the column and you're designing your steel building that's your main thing you're trying to calculate is how thick does my base plate need to be but also then how big does the base plate here we already have db and bb the sort of depth and breadth of the base plate noted in a real design you wouldn't know those offhand and you'd have to assume this um, assume them and try a couple of designs until this works and uh, depending on your values of B and D the, the breadth and the height of the, the base plate it will influence your pattern as well because some of the pattern may fall off the edge as we will discuss soon but anyway so we need to try to determine our thickness firstly now we're going to start with taking the sum of forces at the base of the base of the base plate at bottom of base plate sum of forces vertically equals zero and this is then given us so our applied force is Cu and this is resisted by an effective area times by a stress where the stress is 0 0.6 times the concrete the ultimate concrete um, compressive strength therefore the effective area we need is Cu over 0.6 FCU. So that gives us an equation for how much area do we need. So looking at it, that red hatched area I've got shown, that is the effective area. That's our effective area, and it's just a question of how do we get that, because we need to solve for C. Once we've got that, we can continue with our equations. And so to find C, C um, we must solve, solve using a using equation one, equation one, which we'll call this equation one. That'll govern for everything. Now the equation I'm about to generate is specific to our layout. The question, equation one always governs, but now I'm going to write a specific one for this red layout we've got here. Um, what is its area? So this area now will be our effective area equals, and there are two rectangles at the top, well at the top and bottom around each flange. Now the width of the hatched rectangular red bit is the breadth of the flange B plus 2 times C, so it's one each side, plus thickness of flange plus 2 C. And then also we have a middle component, which is then the distance between our upper and lower red blocks, which I'll go show you shortly. And all of this equation equals our not point uh, so equals our Cu over uh, 0.6 FCU. So just to show you what I was doing there, I've broken that up into two sections, one around the top and a second one in the middle. So all I've done is just the area of that rectangle, where the first term here is 1, and then that is the second term I'm dealing with. Once I've got that equation, I need to get this into the form where we can solve this. Into the form... And I'm alpha c squared plus beta times c plus gamma equals zero. And the cu over 0.6 fc will always come in in that gamma term. Why I use alpha, beta, and gamma for this polynomial is just there's a lot of a's and b's and c's in your calculation. So it can get confusing if you use a sort of traditional a, ax squared plus bx plus c. So I'd rather use it alpha, beta, gamma. But now we solve for C. C. 
and what we end up is with our very traditional solution to this quadratic that is there and now at this stage we can actually solve what is the distance from the column to the edge so we can solve for c now that we've got that we can actually find out what thickness of base plate do we need and by considering it if i zoom in on the section the section through aa just picture it now you've got effectively a support in the middle that bit i've highlighted with load pushing either side and it creates a bending moment in the column that effectively i'm just going to exaggerate it looks something like this so there is our bending moment in the column because it can't fail where the the, the web of the column or the flange of the column, so that middle zone, but it, it will bend all the way up each side. And so I'm just going to call that now the maximum force at the column face, MU. So MU is the moment in the base plate. That's the bending at the position just each side of each column. And if we can find what the moment is, then we can determine what the thickness is because it's the bending in this base plate that actually governs the thickness. So coming back, um, we need to now find the thickness of the base plate. And we can model what I was showing you there as a cantilever. Effectively, what you've got is a cantilever with that load placed upon it which is the stress from the concrete below and once again this load has is applied over some distance C and uh, we now need to find what is the thickness of the space plate so I'm modeling either the left or the right I've drawn the right hand side of section AA above and um, from this what I can now do is find the moment at the column face. Moment at column face. And this is force times distance, where the force is simply the stress times C. And this, sorry, this is for a unit word, for a unit width because it could be almost any distance any width that we are dealing with so we're going to just deal with a width of one whether it's one meter or one millimeter it's a distance of one but so our moment is phi times c times c over two so the first two terms and um, the, the sigma times c so that gives us a force and then times the distance the lever arm um, with equals 0.6 Cu. Now, the base plate resistance this is a just a flat plate, so it, when it bends it's not going to experience any buckling. That means we can design as a class 1 as class 1. Remember class 1 means it's a plastic section that uh, goes right up to the ZP, the plastic um, uh, inertia value. So we've got design as a class 1 continuously supported section, continuously laterally supported section, laterally supported section, i.e. it does not experience buckling, and that means your moment of resistance is simply your partial factor times your ZPL times your yield stress of the steel. And for a rectangular section, your ZPL is BD squared over 4. So in this case, our breadth that we're considering is 1. So this will simplify into twice the thickness over 4. So remember, this is per unit width times the yield strength. Once we've got this, we can come back now and have a look at failure. 
at failure. We want to make sure that our moment is less than or equal to our resistance. Then we know we're safe. So therefore, phi c squared is less than or equal to the equation we have just calculated above. And by manipulating this, we can get to some useful equations. The thickness of base plate is greater than 2 times the stress over the partial factor times the yield strength. And then outside of the brackets, we have the value C. Or C must be less than or equal to thickness of base plate times by the inverse of what we've just shown above, like this. And those two equations are what we can use then to quickly get a thickness of base plate as soon as we have a stress or the, the value for C. So coming back, just as a summary of what we've just done, we took our base plate, we assumed a pattern, we let the load spread out a distance C, then from C, we just solve for C to make sure that the effective area gives us the resistance that we need for Cu. Once we have found C, then we can determine what the thickness of base plate is. You can reverse engineer, for instance, if you know the thickness of base plate, then you can back up, calculate what the maximum value of C is. Now, in the equations I've just worked out below, the base plate layout is for C less than half um, the height minus twice the flange thickness. So basically what's saying there isn't an overlap here in the middle there. But there are cases where as the load increases, you can imagine as that applied for CU gets higher and higher, eventually this pattern will start changing. So I'm just going to shift across here to some other patterns you could potentially get. And you can have almost an infinite number of different patterns, and you'd have to consider it each time, and sometimes you may need to go through this iteratively to get a solution. For instance, if you've got a base plate here, you could have a case where the base where the C value actually overlaps. And then you would have just a continuous stress and it simplifies just to a square or rectangle and that would be then your effective area. But then you may also have a case where the edge distance, so this distance here, um, is actually less than your C value, meaning that your pattern falls off the edge. So now you don't have the full area you were hoping for. And here, once again, you'd have to adjust your effective area, excluding that which falls off the base plate. So each time what we would do is we would adjust our effective area equation to account for whatever shape we've got. Once again, this is when our edge distance A is less than C. So coming back, it would be this equation that I calculated. Uh, for the specific shape here, this effective area, that would change for every shape or every pattern of um, base plate. And you may need to try a couple of patterns until you get something to work, but we would adjust that each time. Often by inspection, you can look at it and quite quickly work it out, um, which would govern. And if in doubt, what's quite useful is you first calculate the area that AF needs to be. If you just take the compressive load Cu divided by 0.6 Fcu, you'll get to an area, and if you look at the area of column, you can kind of roughly work out what pattern would, um, would govern before doing lots and lots of equations. That's one of the quicker ways to solve it. Okay, so that takes us to the end of the derivation, looking at how do we treat these base plates and how do we eventually derive at a, a thickness that we can use to carry the load. Thank you very much.